morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? Yeah? See, I got a good good morning. That's how you do it. <laughs> now you warm them up. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Jermaine, and a, uh, I'm a church planning resident here at Fellowship Pickering. Um, we are planting a church in North Oshawa at some point in the future, and so uh, this is an opportunity for me to preach and to get some uh, experience on the pulpit. I was telling my buddy Pat, um, this is the first time I've preached at, a, at my home church. I've preached uh, many times, I've visited different churches, and I've played a lot of road games, but I've never been at home. So it feels really good to look out and see a bunch of faces that I know, and the same people will be there next week when I come back. So question for you, can anyone here guess how many words the average human speaks in a day? Just shout it out. 5,000. 10,000. Anyone else? 20,000. 40,000. We're, we're going right up. You guys would be terrible at prices, right? <laughs> The average human speaks about 16,000 words a day. If you ask my wife, it's a, probably about 50,000, if it was me. But the, av the average human speaks about 16,000 words a day, and that works out to about 5.8 million a year. Whether we realize it or not, we speak a lot, and our words have power. The words that we say, we have the, the ability to pour into people or to break people down. I'm sure a lot of us here would remember a lot of the conversations we've had in life. We would look back and we would think about some of those times where we've had good conversations, maybe over a good meal or you know, just something really memorable. But I also know for a fact that when we look back, we can probably also remember the, the really tough words that we've said, the words that we've spoken that have hurt people, hurt people in our lives, the, the gossip or, or the idle words or the words of anger. Um, in Mark chapter four, uh, we'll be continuing through the series. For those who don't know, we've been in, this, in, in the book of Mark. And uh, we get up to chapter 4 in Mark. And uh, I'm just going to read through the text, and then I'm going to talk about how that kind of applies to our speech. Uh, the, the, the name of the, of the message is We Are Called to Sow. And so we're going to kind of focus in on the sowing aspect of the parable. But I'm just going to read through the verses, and then we'll see what God says to us through that. So if we pick up in verse 3, uh, Jesus is he's out by the sea. And there's so many people there that he, he has to get into the boat to preach. And so he gets up into the boat, and getting into the boat served two purposes. It gave him a little bit higher ground to be able to speak to people, but it also gave him a quick getaway in case they decided to capture him or rush him or whatever. And so they could just quickly get into the boat and paddle away. Um, so he gets into the boat, and he starts to preach. And so we pick up in verse 3. He says, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it out, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain growing up and increasing and yielding 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. See, what the, the, the job of a preacher is to kind of open up the word and explain what it says and show how it applies to our life. And oftentimes in the parables, Jesus kind of says the parable, and then we're kind of left in the dark to kind of speculate about what it means. But that's not the case in this passage because in verse 14, he kind of picks it up and he explains exactly what the parallel means, what the analogy means. So I'm just going to read uh, from verse 14 here. And he kind of unlocks six, six different parallels. So there's the sower, there's the seed, and then there's the four types of soil. So I'm just going to read through that, and uh, you'll see very plainly what Jesus means here. Verse 14. The sower sows the word, and those and these are the ones along the path. Where the word is sown, when they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. Does anybody know anybody like that? Maybe, maybe it's happened to you or somebody that you've kind of shared the gospel with? Yeah? Soil number two. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, they immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, 
when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. Soil number three. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. And last, the fourth soil. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. I'm just going to pray, and then we'll kind of unpack what this means for our lives. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how you were just a master communicator and you, you were able to speak profound things into our lives using really plain language, plain illustrations that people like us could understand. I pray that you would speak to us today and that we would not leave the same. In your name we pray, amen. So you may be asking, you, know, you may be saying, Jermaine, what, is this have to, what does this passage have to do with me speaking 5.8 million words a year? It has everything to do with it. Uh, I'm sure you've heard this saying before. Uh, it's normally attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Before I pick on the quote, <laughs> this quote has actually been passed down from year after year. And the original quote is actually nothing like this, but this is something that you've probably heard people say. The quote goes like this. Preach the gospel and when necessary, use words. Have you heard that before? I don't like that quote. I don't like it a lot. <laughs> Now look at Romans chapter 10, verses 13 to 15. We see kind of like an alternate reality. Romans chapter 10, verses 13 to 15. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him, in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Now, I realize that the original quote, uh, St. Francis of Assisi, what his heart was is he wanted to make sure that we weren't just talking. We were actually living our lives. But over the years, I've heard this quote be used as a way to say that evangelism has nothing to do with words. Sharing your faith or encouraging a fellow brother and sister in Christ or, or sharing some sort of guidance or wisdom into someone's life has nothing to do with speaking. We should just live our lives and maybe people will ask why we're living the way we are. And so for the sake of that, for the sake of kind of clarifying any sort of confusion, I want to give you a kind of a definition of what I mean by sowing. Sowing is a verbal activity that involves spirit-filled words that are synchronized with spirit-filled behavior, lifestyle, and habits. And so it's not one or the other. It's not about using words or using actions. We're called to do both. We're called to, to love God, love our neighbors, but we're also called to be ready to, to share the, the hope that we have in us to anyone who may ask. And so for that reason, I kind of want to, instead of only focusing on like the soils, I want to kind of unpack four, I guess, four principles that we can learn about the sowing aspect, the verbal ministry that God has called us to. Um, last week, uh, we heard from Brother Seba about the gifts that the victorious Jesus gives to his church for growth and the maturity of the body. And if, I, if you were to ask me, hey, Jermaine, what's the, the one quote that could kind of sum up the whole sermon from last week is this. A church's maturity should be measured by how many members are engaged in ministry, not strictly size. The good guy said that. Yeah. And so if I were to take that from last week and just kind of bridge that over to this week and kind of retrofit it, I would say it like this. A church's maturity or fellowship Pickering's maturity should be measured by how many members are engaged in the work of sowing, not strictly sized. And so I think the question comes to us, how do we be faithful sowers, yeah? How do we do that faithfully? How do we take up this, the, the ministry of sowing and do it well? And so I want to kind of unpack four principles that we can see in this passage. Seeing as Jesus already explained it, now I'm going to focus more on the, applic the application side of what this passage means to our lives. And so the first one, the first principle that we can see here is that uh, we are called to sow unsparingly. We have this picture, um, if, you, if you can imagine for a second. Yeah, there it is. You don't have to imagine. There's a picture. Um, but picture the opposite of this. Can you imagine a farmer taking three or four seeds, putting it in his pocket or into his bag? He walks out to the middle of his 10-acre field, and he stands there, and he reaches into his bag, and he lobs one seed. 
and then two, and then three, and then four. And then he kind of just waits. And he comes back in the fall, and he's just like, where's all the harvest? Where is everything? That's not how farming is done. This is how farming is done. A farmer understands that in order for them to yield a healthy harvest, let's say the harvest was 1,000 plants, they already understand for them to get 1,000, they have to plant 5,000. They already know that there's going to be a number of seeds that don't make it, but in order for them to hit that harvest, in order for them to, to yield the fruit or the vegetables that they need to provide for their families, they have to invest in seed. And so they sow unsparingly. They're not standing back thinking, oh, I'm about to run out of seeds. Like they're buying thousands and thousands and thousands and millions of seeds, and they're sowing it because that's what they want. They want to yield a large harvest. And Jesus is the best example of that. When you look at his ministry, Jesus would preach the word of God to anyone who would be willing to hear. And so just like Jesus, our ministry is to share the word with as many people as possible. Anyone. The guy making your sub at Subway, the guy on the bus, your coworkers, your family members, the mailman who comes at 3.30, whatever it may be, we're called to sow the word of God unsparingly. Not standing back and trying to hold back the seeds. Because let me tell you something, there's no limit of how many seeds there can be. If you have the word of God in you, there is no limit to how many seeds you can spare, or th that you can't spare. So sow unsparingly. That's the first principle. The second one is that we are called to sow indiscriminately, without discrimination. I think when we look at the parable, it's safe to say that the, the sower doesn't know the condition of the soils before he sows. Is that safe? Safe to assume? Because I think if he knew, he would probably spend the majority of his time looking and seeing which soils would produce the best results and then maybe strategically plant it only in those spots. But we, don't, we know that that's not true. The sower doesn't know because if he knew, there wouldn't, there wouldn't have been wasted seed. But the parable says that there were three out of four of the types of seed didn't make it. And so he sows without discrimination. And so in the same way, we are not called to examine the conditions of people's hearts. We're called to sow regardless of where they may be at or where you speculate in your heart where they may be, whether they're close to Christ, they're far from Christ, whether they'll take it or they'll spit in your face or they'll get angry at you or they'll slam the door in your face or they won't be your friend. None of those things matter. We're called to sow and we're not called to spend our time trying to figure out how it'll work. And so sowing is actually an act of faith because it's always a risk. The reason it's a risk is because you have no way to tell the condition of a person's heart. Only God knows, and maybe that person knows, but they probably don't even know. Only God knows the condition of the person's heart that you're sowing into. And so we take that risk, we sow the word of God, and we trust that he will bring fruit. We trust him in faith. And every time we do that, we see in the parable that he does bear fruit. That's the best part, the fourth seed. You should focus on that more than anything. And for me, that's very liberating because it shows me that all I have to do is sow. That's my job, and that's your job. Yeah? So that's the second principle. We're called to sow indiscriminately. The third principle is we are called to sow out of our good soil. Who here would say that they're a Christian or maybe they've heard the gospel before? Yeah, raise your hand. If you raise, if you raise your hand, it means that you are the byproduct of someone sowing the word of God into your life. And so as believers, we all have the potential to bear fruit. Somebody bore fruit in their life, and then they came and they told us about Jesus. And I'm sure every single one of us here who profess Christ could say that we've had a number of people along our journey who have sowed the word of God into our life. Some of those people sowed, some of those people watered, some of those people helped us dig out the rocks, some of those people helped chop down the thorns, some of those people... Um, they were just there to see that fruit get, you know, made. And so that's how it goes. But I'll be completely honest with you, and I, I'm not sure if you, if you feel the same way. When I read the parable, even as a Christian, I can sometimes relate to how some of the, those people or how some of the soils receive the, the word of God. And so there have been times in my life where I've heard the word of God and then I've had the enemy devour it because my heart is hard due to sin, due, due to pride, and, and me just not wanting to hear what God has to say to me. 
there's times where I have heard the word, and instead of focusing on Jesus, the storms of life just, just overwhelm me. Those trials and tribulations is just too much. I can't focus on what God wants to say to me. I'm just looking at that. I'm focused on the storm instead of Jesus who's in the boat. There's times where I've heard the word of God, and then the cares of the world, they, they suck the nutrients out of my life. Bills and, you know, waiting for my clients to pay their invoices. There's these things that they just, they distract you. And so that's happened to me before. I don't know if it's happened to you before. You know, you're in church and, you know, somebody's preaching, but you're not really paying attention because, you know, you're thinking about that bill that's been overdue for 30 days or whatnot. But if you've also, if you put your faith in Jesus, we've also experienced the fourth one where somebody sows the word of God into your heart and then you apply the word and what it says, you submit to God and then you bear fruit. We've experienced that too, right? The difference between you and a person who doesn't know Jesus is that you have a gardener who's in your life who is faithfully pruning you and pouring into you and growing you and watering you, and he's sending people into your life to care for you. That's the difference. And so when we think about how we can receive that growth, the way that God has given fellowship pickering uh, the ways that he, he calls us to cultivate our health is by submitting to the 4G life. You can see on these banners here, if, uh, if you're a visitor, we kind of have our four uh, key things here. These are, the, these are the things that God has given to us to, to cultivate health in our lives. I have a question for you, though. Do, who here has a backyard or a front yard? Yeah? Do you guys get weeds? How, how much time do you guys spend in your garden pulling weeds? And so what happens? Get down on your knees, or you have maybe one of those fancy, if you're one of those rich people, you have one of those fancy ones where you don't have to, to get down. You pull the weeds. You dump them into your fancy uh, brown bag. Not fancy, but you put them in your brown bag. And then what happens the next week? You look out, and there's just <laughs> more than that, were, that was there before, before you pulled it. And so what happens? You just kind of, you either persist and do it again, or you just give up, wait for the snow. You know, my dad told me that the secret to, who wants to know the secret to defeating weeds? This might be like the thing you take away from the message, but the way to have a healthy yard or healthy lawn is not to spend the majority of our time pulling and defeating weeds. We must focus the majority of our time cultivating the soil and the grass. And so what my dad always taught me is when the grass is healthy, it develops deep and thick roots that leave no room for weeds and thorns to get into the cracks. And so what happens is when you have a healthy lawn, and you do get a weed because we all get weeds. It's just there's no way to stop that. When you have that thick, luscious green carpet, and it's just beautiful, and it's like vibrant green. I don't think anyone here can, can relate. Maybe someone, but it's very hard to come by that. But when you have that, and you see that, that dandelion pop up, what happens? You just kind of tug on it gently, and it just pops out. Because when it's healthy, there's no room for that, that weed to develop those deep, thick roots. Because that's what happens, right? You pull the weed out, and it's so deep and thick, and it's like, like, a, like an actual organism. It's like an actual animal just bur burrowed into the dirt. And then you pull it up, and then you break out, and it's like you don't get the full roots, right? And then what happens is it just gets more water, and it grows again. See, when we have healthy grass, when we have healthy soil, that doesn't happen. Because the weeds don't get a chance to develop that, that life and that health. And so that's how it is with the 4G life. When we gather regularly as a church family, that's us huddling together and not leaving room for the enemy to attack and for unhealthy weeds to get in and rob the nutrients that we need to grow. When we group in community and we grow in stages, that's us giving Christians permission to be used by the Holy Spirit to be gardeners of our souls, to pull those weeds out, to, to remove the rocks and to remove the thorns that, that, uh, that rob us of the, the word of God. And so what that looks like is that's when you get close to somebody and they're willing to tell you, brother, you're, you're, you're materialistic. That's, that's greedy. That's, you're struggling with lust. That's lust. That's pride. And, of course, not just them telling you what is going on in your life and going on in your soul, but they're saying, I'm willing to walk with you. God will use me as the gardener to, to pull those things out of your life, and I want you to do the same for me. That's what we say when we group in community and we grow in stages. And lastly, when we give, the fourth G, 
That's us starving out the desires of our heart that says to us, hey, you know what? You should probably just keep that money back. Or you have better things to do on a Sunday morning. You have better things to do than to get into the harvest. When we submit to the, four G, the fourth G, give, that's us investing our time and money and gifts to the development of the body of Christ. It starves out greed. It starves out materialism. And so generosity is a huge part of that. And so I really, really believe that the 4G life is what God has given to Fellowship Pickering to cultivate healthy and luscious plants that bear fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. I, I really want to say something, and I, and I really pray that you receive it well. If we are not attending church regularly, we're not being discipled, if we aren't prioritizing life groups, or we're not tithing, or we're not serving, I can confidently say that we are opening ourselves up to minimal growth in our lives. And if these things are not a priority to us, and this is not me trying to make you feel guilty, this is directly pointed back to myself, but if we're not, if we're not trying to cultivate that health in our lives, then there's a really good chance that we are not sowing into the lives of those around us. It means that our witness is greatly diminished if we're not growing ourselves because it's out of the healthy soil that we bear the fruit, right? It's not out of the hard path or the rocky path or the, the thorns. That's not where the fruit comes from. And so we need to submit ourselves to the cultivation of our soils. And once we do that, we will notice more fruit in our lives as we're able to be healthy in Jesus. Yeah? And so we first, first we sow unsparingly. Then we sow without discrimination. Then we sow from a good health. And last, we're called to sow with expectation and perseverance. I think there's two reasons why we're called to sow with expectation and perseverance. The first reason is because our sowing will make a difference. We have to believe it. We have to have faith that when we do sow the word of God, it will make a difference in people's lives. And the second is that the reason why we sow with expectation and perseverance is because it really isn't about our results. It's about faithfulness, yeah? So we sow because it will make a difference. Uh, in the fall, we uh, had the opportunity to visit our previous home church, TSBC. We have lots of love in our hearts for our, our TSBC family. And uh, went in there, and they asked me to do a two-part series on evangelism. And so we kind of went through the 411 training that some of us have done here at Fellowship Pickering. And uh, we got to the section where we were talking about who God is calling us to reach. And so we did something called an Oikos map. Uh, for those who don't know what that is, what, what, what happens is you, you, bro you would write your name in the middle, circle it, and then you would think and pray about maybe three or five people who God has put in your life. And you'd circle their names, and you'd branch it off from your name. And then from the names that you write, you'd branch off maybe the name of their kids or the people who was in their network. And you can see how multiplication happens. It branches out from, from the person who's sowing. And so I could tell that they were kind of discouraged. They, I know their hearts. They really want to make a difference in their community. But sometimes, like, the small church mentality can really get in the way, right? What can we do? What difference can we make? And so I asked them to do the exercise. They were split up into two tables. And once they did that, uh, they, 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 they had all their names written down. And then I said, not including your own name, count up all of the circles on your papers. And so they went through and they added up the circles. And as they added up the circles, I could start to see the, the, their emotion change because they went, there were only 12 people in the room, you know, 12 people, but that 12 led to, you know, 50, 60. And by the time we added it up, it came up to 186 people. And so I said to them, with your faithfulness, with what, you, if you are doing what God is calling you to do, even just from this preliminary exercise, it doesn't even include all the people that you have in your circles. It doesn't include all the people that are in this church, just from the people in this room, just from what we've done in the last 10 minutes, you have the potential to impact over 186 people by sharing your faith and loving your neighbors. And so I told them, I was like, this is not just an accident. This is God, how God designed it. This is a biblical principle. When you look at Paul and Lydia in the book of Acts or Peter and Cornelius or Jesus and the demoniac or Jesus and the woman at the well, all of those stories involve Jesus coming in and sowing the word of God into their lives. And we see that they, they were the healthy soils and the healthy seed burrowed into the soil and it, and it developed roots. And what happened? They went out 
in excitement and in passion, and, they, and it says over and over, they went out and they told people about what Jesus had done. It talked about how the message that Jesus, they wanted to share what Jesus had done in their lives, and they wanted to share who Jesus was. And we see some of, you know, you have like the Church of Philippi come out from that, that situation with Paul and Lydia. That's where we get the book of Philippians. And so that comes from faithfulness. That comes from believing that what happens is when you, when you sow, it will make a difference. And so we sow with expectation because the Lord of the harvest will bring life. Do you believe that? The second one is we sow because it's not about results. It's about faithfulness. A couple weeks ago, I was at Tim Hortons, and uh, I was you know, hanging out with Harley, and uh, we, after we had finished our time and we were going through the word, I could sense God say, hey, look at that. There's a young man over there. I want you to go talk to him. So I went up to him. I introduced myself, and uh, he told me his name was Jay. He's in grade 12, and uh, he, he had a spare that morning, and so he happened to just be at Tim's a little later in the day. And so I asked him if he wanted to do a church planning survey which we use to kind of start open conversations and kind of gain insight of the community. And he starts to fill out the survey. We go through it question by question. And uh, I start to see that God had been moving in his life. God had been talking to him about certain things. He had questions and he had doubts and he had comments and opinions about, about faith and what life looks like. And as we started to go through it, I started to realize that this God is talking to this guy. And so I asked them, I said, what's, what's standing in your way from putting your faith in Jesus right now? And he said, well, I think I, I need to get my life clean. And I was like, that's, that's not true. Because if you could have cleaned yourself up, you would have. You could have if you, you would have if you could have. But that's not what God has called us to. God, is, God in the word says that if you, if you call in the name of Jesus, you will be saved. You don't need to clean yourself up. That's Jesus' job. And so I said, again, what's getting in the way of you putting your faith in Jesus? And so he sat there quietly. You know, when, you know, when you're in a conversation, two minutes is a really long time. <laughs> but like two minutes go by. And he goes, I don't think there's anything that's stopping me from putting my faith in Jesus. And so I said, Jay, do you, do you want to, let's pray. You can, you can receive Jesus now. And so he prays to Jesus. He asks for Jesus to forgive his sins and for Jesus to become the Lord of his life. And, you know, he says, amen. And we talk. We make plans. I said, you know, it's really important to be discipled, and it's really important to be in a healthy church. And so we exchanged contact info, and he told me that he wanted to come to church, and he wanted to be in the Word, and he needed help to have the Word explained to him. And so, yeah, we went on our we went our separate ways, and uh, I was so excited. You know, I came back, and I told Leah, and I, that's my wife, for those who don't know, and I told her about this amazing story of this young man putting his faith in Jesus, and then I texted and uh, some of my mentors, and I said, you'll never believe what happened. This is what happened. This young man put his faith in Jesus, and everybody said, I'm proud of you, Jermaine. That's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, I went on to our, our, our prayer support group on Facebook, and I told the story. I said, yeah, yeah, this is what happened. Everybody was like, that's awesome. Lots of likes, lots of thumbs up, lots of hearts. Everybody was super excited for us. And, and when you see the kingdom moving, there's just nothing like it, right? But hours went by, and I reached out to Jay, and no response. And hours turned to days, no response. And slowly, I started to get discouraged, and I could hear the enemy saying things to me, and my flesh coming alive saying, maybe you were too aggressive, or, or maybe you tricked him into believing, or maybe you forced him to profess Jesus, or maybe he just was scared and gave in to, to you, maybe you pressured him too hard or you pushed him too hard or whatever. And the, I could hear the enemy trying to discourage me. But as I was preparing for this very sermon, I came across 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 to 7. And this is what the word of God does to us. It has the ability to encourage us and get us back on the path and crush the voice of the enemy in our lives. Verses 6 to 7, it says, I planted, that's Paul, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only the Lord gives growth. And I couldn't believe it because it was like I could hear the voice of Jesus saying, it's not you who gives growth. It's not your job to grow this guy. Your job is to be faithful and to do what I say. You leave the results to me. That's not your work. And stop trying to do my work. <laughs> 
But then he said to me, the only way that you could have failed in this situation is if you didn't sow at all. And you did. And I'm very happy that you did that. My mentor, uh, Michael, Michael Thompson, he was one of the first people to disciple me. Every time I would meet up with him, he'd <laughs> ask me this really annoying question. He'd say, what's the difference between you and your non-believing friends? He's like, if, if, I, had to, if I took a, a list of your deeds and I put it beside your, your non-Christian friend's lifestyle, what, what, what difference would I see? And I used to, like, suck my teeth at him. Oh, come on, man. Like, what are you saying to me, man? Get out of here. But as I got older, one of the, the things that I noticed and one of the differences between me and my non-believing friends, one of the, the, what, the way we measure success is not by results. The way we measure success is by faithfulness. And so it's hilarious. I, I started, to, as I was driving home, I started to imagine Jay's life. It started to unfold before my eyes. I, I imagined that he got saved and then I would get to baptize him and then he would get discipled and he would lead many to Jesus and I'd do his wedding and he'd plant a church and I started to imagine all this stuff. I, I, we live like 10 minutes from Tim, so like it was happened really quickly. And you know what? That day may yet come, right? And those are all good things to want for a person. But that's not how Jesus measured success and that's not how we're called to measure success. You know, at one point in Jesus' ministry, thousands followed him. Thousands followed him. The people, he was the most famous guy. Everybody wanted to hear him preach. Every town he went to, people would flock to him and from anywhere. They would come from all over the place to hear Jesus speak. But as we go through the timeline and we start to see Jesus going towards the cross, those thousands became hundreds and those hundreds became dozens. And when you get to the, the final destination and Jesus is at Calvary, who was there? John? Simon of Cyrene? He didn't even really want to be there. He just got kind of pulled in. Like, carry this guy's cross. He's like, what? I was, I was going to the store. And then who else was there? His mom? Imagine if Jesus used our fleshly definition of success. He, had, he used a different definition. John 6, verse 38 says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. That's how Jesus measures success. And so that's how we measure success, yeah? And so as I bring the message to a close, we, we learn that we are called to sow. The average person speaks about 16,000 words every single day. My question for you is how are you going to use your words? Will you use your words to sow unsparingly without discrimination? Will you? we go. Will you fill yourself with the word of God so that from your overflow you can sow into the lives of anyone you encounter? Will you sow with perseverance and expectation? Fellowship Pickering, I, I really believe this. You play a very vital role in the health of the body of Christ by the words that you speak. And so I want us to covenant today to use our words for the building up of God's kingdom as we sow truth in the, into the hearts of people we meet every single day. Will we do that? Yeah? Are you going to share the word of God with somebody this week? Encourage them. Share, share the gospel with them. Speak truth into their lives. I promise you it will bring fruit. But your faithfulness is all that matters. Yeah? If you're here this morning and you haven't given your life to Jesus, you may be asking yourself, what, what does this message have to do with me? You're talking about evangelism and I'm not even a Christian. And so here, here's what it has to do with you. We... we, we from the beginning of the parable, we saw that uh, the seed was the word of God. And so I want to sow this seed into your heart right now. You know, as Christians, the reason why we're here today is to celebrate what Jesus has done for us. Bottom line, that's why we're here. We're here to celebrate the perfect life that Jesus lived, the perfect death that Jesus died, and the perfect way he defeated death by raising from the dead. And the word says, like, like I said to Jay, I'll say to you again. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Yeah? Do you believe that? If you call on his name, you can receive salvation today right here in this very building. And so if that's you, I'll be right in the back somewhere. Um, you can come talk to me afterwards or talk to Pastor Scott or anyone. Maybe you came with a friend or something like that. You can talk to them if you want to discuss what that looks like. But uh, I just want to pray and ask God to kind of fertilize the word that he's given to us. Yeah?
Jesus Christ, we thank you for your word that you give to us. We thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to not only help us to read the word, but to also apply it. And so I pray that as we meditate on your word, we meditate on the parable of the sower, that we would really, really consider what that means for our lives and that we would take seriously the call to be sowers, to sow unsparingly, without discrimination, from good health, and with expectation and perseverance. God, we, we pray this in faith, and we know that you will convict us and empower us to do this this week. And so we pray these things in your name. Amen.